Just Ahead on American Black Journal, a program that puts books in barbershops to promote reading among African-American boys. Plus, a local coach teaches boxing and life skills and an organization that's giving a voice to black women in construction. American Black Journal starts now. Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. For nearly 100 years, Ally has been a part of Detroit, and we give back by volunteering and donating in our community. We have a commitment to diversity and increasing economic mobility in our hometown. At Ally, we're dedicated to doing it right every single day and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson, a program that encourages African-American boys to read while they're waiting their turn at the barbershop has come to Detroit. Originating in Harlem, the Barbershop Books Initiative aims to increase literacy among black boys. The U.S. Department of Education says more than 85% of fourth grade African-American males are not proficient in reading. The program generates child-friendly reading spaces in barbershops and provides early literacy training to barbers. Joining me now is the Detroit program manager, Reverend Lonnie Peake, along with Saul Green, who is owner of Michigan Barber School, the first Detroit location to participate. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thanks for having us, yeah. Thank you. So what a great idea, right? We were talking before the show about how much time we all spent <laughs> in barbershops, yeah. mostly as kids. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the idea that you could make good use of that time uh, is, is really ingenious. I think it, it, it's the culture of the barbershop, particularly the black barbershop. As I said earlier, you know, the barbershop is the black man's country club. <laughs> you know, you, you, in order to join, you just go. You just go. <laughs> I used to, as I mentioned too, I used to just go and sit. My uncle owned a barbershop in Nashville Park, New Jersey. And I would just go and sit and listen, mm -hmm. and you gain so much wisdom. <laughs> so what we have now is the place where you're going to come to get your hair cut with, with, with your, your, your youngster. And now we move it into an educational piece where he can learn yeah. while he's sitting there. Yeah. So what greater uh, environment than to have books in the barbershop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Michigan Barber School is the first place to participate. Uh, talk about why. Stephen, it, it made sense. Uh, Michigan Barber School, first of all, has been around for 72 years. It's probably, if not the oldest, but one of the oldest is black businesses in the state of Michigan. Yeah. And so we've seen through the generations the uh, parents bringing their young sons in. And, and the opportunity that uh, Lonnie has described is just ripe for that environment. As I spend time in the barber school, one of the things that I find most um, um, heartening is a number of people who come up to me and said, I came here as a child, mm -hmm. I'm bringing my son <laughs> here. <laughs> and so you see this intergenerational mm -hmm. communal aspect of a barber shop and the barber school represents that, Michigan Barber School represents that in the state of Michigan probably more than any other place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so how, tell me how the program works, where you get the books and how, okay. who's providing the training to the barbers and it's a, it's a national program Stephen that we're in about 14 states uh -huh. and it's coming out of New York and they decided they want to come into Michigan so obviously you can't come into Michigan unless you come into Detroit right. <laughs> and uh, uh, Wayne Great Start Collaborative was the organization that they came to and uh, 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 Kathleen Alexandro came to me and asked me hey I know you got good tentacles out in the community 
we want you to help us organize this. And so we jump in it. So our role is program managers. So what we do is that we do the coordination, the assisting the placement of it, and then come, around, come back around. There's been training for the barbers. We've kicked off now. And now we're starting to put the books in the individual barber shops. And, and Saul hosted us for our first press conference. Mm -hmm. And you know you got four, you got fifty two chairs out there. Yes. He yes. has a, little, a young city out yeah, there. Right. <laughs> city of barbers. Yeah, city of barbers, man. So we went to Saul first, and he was very gracious and agreed to open the door. So we kicked it off at his shop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Saul, I, I've got you here. I would be remiss if I didn't let you talk about the importance of. Uh, the, 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 the trade and skill of barbers in your family. This is not just work for you. This is quite a personal passion. It, it, it absolutely <laughs> is. Like I um, said earlier, my, my dad started the Michigan Barber School mm -hmm. in 1947. He was part of that great migration coming up from East Point, Georgia, right outside of Atlanta. His dad had had a barber shop. He was a graduate of Morehouse College with a degree in sociology, got here, took several social, uh, sociology related jobs, but his entrepreneurial spirit yeah. took over mm -hmm. and he realized that this was an avenue for black men generally mm -hmm. to, to, deter, to develop a skill yeah. and to become their own um, uh, business owners. And so over these 72 years, we have uh, educated and placed thousands of mm. black barbers in, uh, in the Detroit metropolitan area and really throughout the state. Yeah. And so um, <laughs> it was my dad, my, brother, my two brothers ran it. I am now in there running it because uh, <laughs> uh, it was my time. Right. I'm a barber. Yeah. And and yeah. uh, so it's, it is. It's See, it's a, interesting that you call yourself a barber. I mean, most people in this community who know right, you right, right, right. know you as an attorney, which you also are, but, uh, but you're a barber. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I claim it proudly. Yeah. Uh, I've often said to people in terms of any success I've had as a lawyer, a lot of it probably has to do with the time I spent in the barbershop. Mm -hmm. Because the way you have to engage people and deal with problem solving, yeah. a lot of that you learn through the That's interactions really that happen so often in a barbershop yeah. setting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that stat that I read in the, in the intro, 85% yes. of fourth grade. Boy, I, you know, I, I knew that we had a challenge. Mm -hmm. With that, I don't think I knew it was quite that mind-boggling. Mind-boggling. Yeah. And and as you, I don't have to tell you, Steve, but it, you know, being able to read the written word is your gateway to success. Sure. Right. So we think that this particular no, we know that this particular program is going to buy, provide access and entertainment because the books are all selected black 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 boys. Okay. And they're colorful. The stand sets up in the barber shop. They can come. They can take a look at the book. Now, some barbershops have been reported, hey, the book is kind of like disappearing. <laughs> they're taking the yeah, book. They're take, That's not well, a bad that thing, That ain't right? all bad, man. Let them have the book. Yeah, Don't right. beat them up. <laughs> the worst thing is that there's another book in somebody's home. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And so we replace it. Uh, we'll go around monthly, take a look at what's happened, talk to the barber, and we're replacing it. Right now, we have 24 barbers on our list. We have ramped up about eight. Okay. And so now we're moving to, to bring on the others. We don't want we want to get it where it's manageable. We don't yeah. just want to have a thousand barbershops. We would eventually, since this is a pilot, we're working it. And like we said, Saul has been very helpful. And we had a training for the barbers a couple of weeks ago at Wayne County Community College. They came in, we fed them, we trained them, and we was trying to get out of there, but they kept <laughs> asking us questions. Hey, man, we've been here for two hours. <laughs> anyway, we're very excited about the program. Yeah. And it's another niche in Detroit. It's a neighborhood program in Detroit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that importance, that connection of barber shops to neighborhoods is, yes. is everything uh, yes. in the city. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, quickly, uh, how are the barbers responding? Uh, to this. They, they, they see it as an excellent opportunity to, to interact with young people. Yeah. It's interesting, a lot of the students, they bring their children to, uh, uh, the while shop. they're yeah. putting in their time. This gives them an opportunity to give their children something concrete to work yeah. on while they're putting in their hours. It's a natural fit. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, well, congratulations and uh, thanks for being here. Sure. Good, yeah. good. Thank you. Good to see you both. Thanks for having us, man. <laughs> Thank Appreciate you. it. Yes. Just ahead, an, or an organization that creates opportunities for African American women in the construction industry. But first, here's a 1985 Detroit Black Journal discussion about the use of black English. 
let's talk about black English first of all. I go to you, uh, Dr. Chanel, first. What exactly is it? Uh, I would like to, in a sense, suggest uh, to your audience that black English is a, an expression of uh, a segment of people, American people in this country, uh, who have had a long and very arduous, uh, very difficult uh, experience and uh, one that uh, certainly uh, encompasses the, the whole notion of segregation, uh, one that has uh, uh, many, many kind of unique and peculiar uh, features about it, uh, uh, so much so until indeed it is a language. Now and that's one thing I want to ask and I'll, I'll, I'll shift gears here throughout the whole conversation. He said it is a language. Now, do you consider it a language? Is it a language? Is it a dialect? I mean, now we hear and we have trouble with the form of be, let's say, for instance, in black English. Mm -hmm. I be going to the store. We saw the little piece that we had on. Is it a language? Is it a dialect? <clears throat> There's no doubt about the fact that black English is a language. However, I'm not a linguist or a sociolinguist, and when I start talking about black English, I look at it in another way. And one of the things that I say that black English is, is that it is the current excuse for some people to practice racism. And I think that's part of the context. In fact, for me, that's a major context in which I look at black English. Uh, the mm -hmm. fact that the language spoken by black Americans now joins with skin color as a signal for people to practice racism. The National Association of Black Women in Construction was created to give a voice to the unique challenges faced by African-American females in the industry. The organization provides economic, educational, and social opportunities for its members. Next month, the Detroit chapter will highlight the importance of partnerships at its first annual Building Sustainable Communities event. Here to tell us more is the Detroit president, Tylean Henry. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So uh, there's no there's no surprise, I guess, in the idea that uh, African Americans need uh, different and sort of uh, uh, more robust support structures in lots of industries. Absolutely. Uh, but I think when you say black women in construction, you probably still get uh, some strange looks from some people who are like, oh. I didn't quite know that uh, black women were, were doing that uh, in large numbers. So talk about how, uh, how large that presence uh, is. It's very large. It's, it's here in uh, the Metro Detroit area, our membership is you know, somewhere a little bit under 100 members, um, but we're looking at not just individuals, but we're talking about businesses. Sure. So these are women that are employing uh, returning citizens, employing um, youth and folks in our community that have a skilled trade. Yeah. Um, whether that be carpentry, whether it be cement, whether it be drywall refinishing. Um, we have women that are building road, major expressways and roads. Yeah. So um, it's a very wide presence. And I think what's really important to understand is that we've been building uh, since the beginning of time. Hmm. And so, you know, you think of construction as something physical, but it's also something that we have to do from um, an internal and mental standpoint. Huh. So, so, yeah, talk a little more about what you mean by that. Absolutely. Um, so when we talk about building communities, we're really talking about making sure that we are acknowledging um, the wealth and the resources that we have in the communities. Um, the physical structures may appear to be um, you know, impoverished, mm -hmm. but there is so much value there. Um, and we do that by being in, in some of the schools and speaking with some of the students about the opportunities that they have. And that's just not here in Detroit, but that's on a national level um, that we are, you know, getting into school districts, helping them understand the different careers in the trades, um, understanding how STEM can turn into a, a viable and, and excellent living in which you're not only building a business, but you can build your community. Yeah. You can provide jobs. Yeah. Um, uh, talk about the kind of special support structures that you feel like uh, we still need to make sure are there to support black women who work in construction. Absolutely. So advocacy is so important. Um, you know, whether it's connecting uh, our members with folks in the SBA that can help them with their business development, um, connecting them with access to capital, um, making sure they're aware of various procurement events that happen around, you know, Metro Detroit and all around Michigan. 
uh, those resources are out there. But mm -hmm. a lot of times when you're in a business and you're working, grinding day to day, um, you're building within your community, you don't always have the opportunity to take a look up and see that, hey, Goldman Sachs has an excellent program, <laughs> that if I get into this program, it can take my business to the next level. Yeah. And the key piece with our members and the, and the people who are drawn to our organization is that we're looking at not just taking ourselves up. We're looking at bringing up our community, pulling people behind, and uh, absolutely and, uh, how important that that always is. Uh, talk about the, the the current landscape in Detroit for black women in construction. I mean, we've got all this building going on. I mean, it really is a boom mm -hmm. uh, that that we're experiencing. But of course, we're seeing it unfold a little bit unevenly. I think uh, in terms of who's able to participate, who's benefiting. Is that also true for uh, black women? That's what I'm seeing. Um, but I will tell you that I'm very encouraged, uh, very excited about the opportunities to come. Um, and when we talk about those resources and those gaps, quite often you need to have certain licenses. Mm -hmm. You have to have certain certifications to really be considered. Um, there are certain documents that you need to have in place. And so we have all of this talent. We have all of this experience. But there are you know, some smaller businesses that they need to just get those finishing touches so that they can really compete. Mm -hmm. And so that's what that's what we help them to be able to do. Yeah. Um, and you kind of talked about kind of the disparity in opportunities. And so often we look at the city and we see all these great things happening in the in the the big buildings coming up, but there's a lot of projects that people can have access to that may not be the large, you know, 20 story building, yeah. right? Um, there's opportunities within communities to do landscaping. There's opportunities um, within communities to help with some of the water lines that are going on. So really just helping people identify, you know, where is their area of expertise and competency and how do we connect them with those opportunities um, so that they can be successful and be positioned to, to grow. Yeah. Let's talk about your event, uh, the upcoming event. Yeah. Uh, what will people get from this? Uh, Absolutely. This um, so our special guest is Congresswoman Br Brenda Lawrence, mm -hmm. um, and we're really excited to have her to join us. Um, you know, over the past few years that I've had an opportunity to get to know a little bit more about her uh, work and kind of her, her what's driving her, um, we love that she's advocating for uh, fair wages for women. Uh, we love that she's advocating for, you know, making sure that we can have clean water for our students in schools across America, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that they, they're not being poisoned by their water. Um, and we love that she's advocating for small businesses. And so the opportunity by coming there is not only that you're going to be connected with, you know, folks are the, that are making decisions today yeah. that are not just going to impact us but our children for the next you know, three, five, 10, 20 years. Yeah. Uh, and we think it's important that folks that are in leadership in communities, uh, black club leaders, um, people that are developing within the community can connect with the folks that are making the decisions. Yeah. And that the folks making the decisions can see the success that's happening within our communities. That people are gathering together, they're getting on one accord, putting plans in place and executing them and there's progress happening. And how do we reach out to the next community and the next community to ensure that they are aware of those resources as yeah. well? Yeah, well that sounds like a really wonderful opportunity. So excited about it. Yeah. Okay, well uh, good luck with that. Thank and you. thanks very much for being here with I us. I appreciate yeah. you having me. Yeah. Finally today, we want to introduce you to a Detroit boxing coach whose training sessions help his young students develop strength and discipline. His name is Julio Hernandez, and his story is the focus of a short documentary by director Alicia Vandenbush. The film is titled Little Julio, and it played at the recent Freep and Cinetopia Film Festivals. Let's take a look. When I originally came out here, it was just to have a boxing gym for professionals and personal clients. Get your hands back, Pete. Pete, get your hands back. I mean, I was happy and it was fulfilling, but it was kind of like still a little void in my day and just the course of everything. It was just something missing. I was coming down the neighborhood and I heard uh, windows breaking. And I seen some kids in a little group throwing rocks at an abandoned house at the windows. And I walked up on the kids, and a lot of them scattered. But one kind of just, just stuck in front of me. And I told him, I said, if you run, I'm going to catch it. So it's better that we just talk right now. So he got teary-eyed, and I asked him why was he doing it. 
Yeah. And he said he had nothing else to do. So I told him I was a coach and I asked him if he wanted to see the gym. With word of mouth, it just started building. Jimmy, you're training, when you go home, you ain't got much to get into. But that bed, especially my little guys. Man, they mama's telling me, Coach, we love you so much, there ain't no noise in the house. They eat, bang, hit the bed, next day at school. I got one kid here, this was a homework assignments. He got a write-up, he tore it up and hid it in his bag. His mom found it and brought it to me. And he was doing push-ups and sit-ups all day long. I extend myself to the mothers like that. Up. Everything is about being taught. You act the way you're taught, the way you're brought up. That's what you reflect out. Now move, Jaden, move. Remember I tell you, pick your spots. You fight when you want to fight. I was raised by my mother. My mother, my grandmother, and my sister. And yeah, my father wasn't in the picture. Go up in that corner over there. Maybe elders in the neighborhood, you know, older guys that I grew up with. That's probably what rubbed off on me. But as far as actually my father, not, not much to talk about there. I'm trying to refrain to talk about it too. So we keep this PG. <laughs> you know, I lost my mom about 17 years ago. And to this day, it hurts just as much as the day she left. It's my best confidant I've ever had. She was in my corner and I was in hers as well. She called me Julito, Julito for a long time, till I was like about around 30, and then she started calling me Jay. And Julito is little Julio. So this coaching thing is kind of like, uh, people get caught up in living vicariously through fighters. I hate that. I hate coaches to do that. You know, I teach them basics, I teach them little tricks, but a lot of times I just pull back and let them figure it out. A lot of coaches want them to fight like they fought. No, it's a different human being, it's a different personality. And you don't want to have a gym of 10 kids that all fight like you. Let them build up their own way to fight. Very good. <laughs> but yeah, a lot of times I'll just sit back and be in my chair and just watch them. And Watch their little mannerisms and they want me to talk to them and tell them what they're doing wrong or ask them how their day was. The looks in their eyes, it's the highlight of my day. There you go, there you go. Oh! Hit it, there you go, there you go. Push, push! 15. And it was like kind of a calling like, God told me, look, this is what you need to do. This is what's gonna keep you, this is the way you're gonna end your life. This is the way you're gonna finish. This is the last chapter of your life. It's gonna be boxing like this. And then he brought the kids to me saying, this is what you're gonna do to give back for me saving your ass all the time. All I want from him is a chance. That's all, just give them a chance to be productive, to, to live life, to be able to sit behind a desk like this and tell a story at 53 years old. That's a lot nowadays. These kids died 19, 20, 21, not even a quarter of their lives. Yeah, so my whole thing is just give them a chance.
That's our program for today. Thanks for watching. You can go to AmericanBlackJournal.org for more information on our guests and to check out past episodes. And you can always connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and their brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, a partner with communities where children come first. The Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. For nearly 100 years, Ally has been a part of Detroit, and we give back by volunteering and donating in our community. We have a commitment to diversity and increasing economic mobility in our hometown. At Ally, we're dedicated to doing it right every single day and viewers like you. Thank you.